All right, we are all the way up to Genesis chapter 3, one of the most amazing texts that we have. Uh, Part of Genesis is considering what is the reason for everything? Why is the world the way it is, for better and for worse? And this is one of those great texts. But let's ask the Holy Spirit to do His work as we read it. Thank you, Lord, for gathering us today in the house, the house of the Lord. We're so grateful to be in one another's company. We thank you that you've lifted us up in worship. We thank you that you desire to speak to us from your word. Uh, That's work that you've got to do, Lord Jesus, and we pray that you would touch our hearts with the truth of your gospel. In Christ's name, amen. So listen then to God's word, and uh, you may want to keep your Bibles open to Genesis chapter 3. We'll be looking through this uh, text really closely as we go through the sermon today. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say, you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, oh, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that's in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you shall not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. You will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. They sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. There are deep mysteries in this passage. The secret things belong to the Lord our God. One of the joys, I think, of being a Christian is that we have such great stories. So often you say to people, you may not believe anything, but just join the church for the food or for the fellowship. I mean, there's great food here. It's great, great times. I would say just join a church for the stories. Nobody's got stories like we do. I mean, I know the TNT network has their slogan, we know drama. But with all due respect, we know drama. We've got the stories. We've got action. We've got dialogue. We've got poignancy. We've got passion. We've got power, we've got depth, we've got stories that are so simple a child can understand them on the first reading, but so complex the greatest theologian can never exhaust their meaning. Our stories are amazing. Just for themselves, it's enough to make me want to be a Christian. Who's got such a treasure trove of stories? These stories from Genesis are are, are the greatest. What we've been talking about is the reason why we're here. What are people? Why are we here? And what went wrong? This is what the foundational chapters of Genesis is all about. Truthfully, there's no one who's ever had a higher view of what it means to be a human than Christians do. People who have a source of their thought and life in Genesis declare, who are we? We are expressly and intentionally designed and made in the image of the creator of the cosmos. We are here by his expressed will, each one of us unique, each one of us made for his glory, each one of infinite worth to the one who made them. The world, Calvin said, is a theater for God's glory. And the Bible tells us that we are the lead actors in the story of glorifying the God who made all things. As we enact lives of love and worship and faithfulness, We fulfill our created intent and bring glory. We make the creator shine. The God who is light shines brighter when we take our place. That's a high view of what it means to be human. That's a gloriously astounding, wondrously high view. I'm not an accident. I'm not a bit of protoplasm that just happened to get conscious for a while before I return. I'm not someone that Allah is mad at because I'm so bad. 
I'm not someone that needs to detach from reality because all my suffering is just an illusion and I'm too full of myself. I am a creation specifically called into being by God to glorify Him. He loves me utterly. He's after something marvelous in my life. What a high view of humanity. But we have a problem, don't we? And the problem is, for having such a glorious and high view of what it means to be human, we know in our heart of hearts, it ain't working out that way. I can imagine being more than I am. I read that I'm supposed to be more than I show. What's the problem? Well, today's story tells us that for all we were made to be, at the heart of the story of humanity, there was a fall. We fell away from what we were meant to be by our own choices. It's no wonder people get scared and angry at Christianity because it's the death knell to our pride. We have this incredibly high view of what it means to be human and this incredibly realistic and low view of our own culpability in screwing up the world. You've got to be a bracing realist to follow the biblical view. So screw up your courage. Let's plunge into the story. This is how it was told. The first sentence is a loaded sentence. Just out of nowhere, seemingly, from the wonder of the garden and the man and woman being together, it says, now the serpent was more crafty than any other creature which the Lord God had made and placed in the garden. That is a loaded phrase. The serpent was more crafty than any other creature the Lord God had made and placed in the garden. We've got to unpack that. There's at least three things to see. Probably there are a hundred things, but let's limit it to three. The first thing to realize is that the serpent was created. He's not an eternal principle or power of evil that's always been sort of in balance to the Creator's goodness. Our faith is not like the yin and the yang of Chinese philosophy, where throughout the cosmos there's this battle between good and evil, two equal powers that turns everything. No, the serpent was a created being. Now, we're meant to understand, I think, that we've got something more going on here than a reptile. It's not just a talking snake. We're meant to understand that there's a spiritual force at work here. There is a superhuman power who's arrived in the garden in the guise of the serpent. But whatever he may be, he's not the creator and he's not eternal. He was made by the creator. Second thing to know from this text is that the serpent was crafty. He was cunning. That's a warning light. Everything this actor will say on the stage, you should listen to very carefully because there's more going on than it appears. He's going to be the master of the half-truth. He's going to be the great shell game player, showing you one thing meaning another. He's crafty. Be careful. And then thirdly, the serpent's presence is a mystery. There's no explanation given as to why he comes onto the stage. It's one of those secret things that belongs to God. Why is it that a good creation with this pinnacle of, of all created things, the man and the woman, should have to now encounter a tempting spirit? We don't know. Scripture just says it is. This is the way it is. God knows alone why there had to be the introduction of a tempting power into his good creation. In Scripture, it's always simply a given. There is evil. There is a temptation. We are not told why, but we have to deal with it. So somehow this created being, whose words are going to be cunning, is going to be the source of trying to move God's good creatures out of their goodness and their innocence. Or right, that is an introduction. Let's take a look at what he says. He sidles up to the woman and he says, So, did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? Seems a fair question. Do you think he was looking for theological information? Or maybe he was just trying to get it straight that he hadn't quite overheard what the Lord said to Adam? No, it's very clever. 
Because the best way to introduce doubt is not by making a bold assertion to begin with, but simply ask a seemingly innocent question. Introduce the idea. What if the God who made you actually has the opposite character of what he appears to have? What if surrounded by the abundance of Eden, with all these beautiful trees and this lush growing fruit, where you have more to do than you can do for a lifetime to occupy you, and it's all declared good, what if actually God set it up to torture you? What if God doesn't really have your best interest in mind, but really wants to set up the whole thing and then keep you from enjoying it? What if God doesn't want you to be happy? Did he really say you can't eat fruit from any of the trees in the garden? It's just a thought. Maybe you're not supposed to like any of this. Maybe God's all about restricting you and ruling you. Well, to her credit, the woman answers correctly. She says, well, no, we, we can eat fruit from any of the trees of the garden. It's just that one in the center, God says, if we eat it or touch it, on that day we'll die. She gets it that God's rule is 1% restrictive and 99% freedom. She upholds the character of her creator in her first reply. No, the whole world is for us. God didn't make the world to torture us. He made us to move out into the world and to delight in it, to rule it, to subdue it, to tend it, to enjoy it. It's just that one little area. We don't know why. I don't even understand what dying would be. He said, no, I don't even think about it because I have so much else to do. Well, the subtle temptation has been rebuffed. So the serpent gets a little more direct. He gets right in her face with defying God's word exactly. He says, oh no, you will not surely die. For God knows that in the day you eat of the fruit, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. This is another loaded phrase. Direct contradiction. You will not surely die. Genesis 1, 28 has said, you will surely die because God knows on the day that you eat it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. Let's unpack that in four quick sentences. Here's the first one. It says, you will not surely die. That's a half-truth. The serpent is introducing the idea that God actually lied to you. You're not going to die. They didn't know what death was. Nothing had yet died. And the truth was, when they ate the fruit, they didn't fall down dead. They didn't just cease to be. So he was right. You can eat that fruit and you'll still be walking around. You'll still be breathing. You'll still be here. It's just that when they ate the fruit, death and decay and disorder entered the whole creation. When they ate the fruit and disobeyed their creator, spiritually they did die, for they were cut off from their intimate knowing of the creator, and their own relationship was ruptured. It was ruined. Half-truths. They didn't just cease to be, but death entered creation. For God knows, the second one. The serpent is claiming superior knowledge. Isn't that awful when someone does that? Have you ever heard them do that to you with your spouse or your friend? You don't really know what she says in private, but I do. You may think you know so-and-so, but I tell you I have some knowledge you don't have. God knows, says the serpent. Wait a minute. The woman should have said, we walk together in the cool of the evening. The Creator's given me all of this, but you're telling me that He's holding back something? that there's something about God I should know but don't know? Serpent should have been an insurance salesman or a, a salesman of legal advice or of elixirs of life or any other thing where you make your sale based on having superior knowledge that the other person doesn't have about life. I know about these stocks and bonds in a way that you don't, so trust me on this one. Even though it's against your better judgment, buy the elevator pass in your high school. No elevator passes? That wasn't done in your high school? 
That was a big deal. There was no elevator, obviously, in my school, but freshmen would be sold elevator passes by upperclassmen. It was one of the great deceits. He claims, it's just now dawning on you, I'm feeling very, very, very old. <laughs> but kids, try this at your school. It would work. Bring back the old stuff. Guaranteed income. The serpent claims superior knowledge. God knows you won't die. Okay, then thirdly, he says, your eyes will be opened. Another half-truth. We saw in Genesis 2 that their eyes were opened, that they looked at each other and they were naked. They knew each other naked and not ashamed. That meant they could relate completely openly and honestly. There was nothing hidden. They saw right through to the heart of each other and they related face to face with God himself. But yes, when they ate the fruit, their eyes would be opened in another way. Their eyes would be open to the guilt they incurred. Their eyes would be opened to shame that would make them want to close their eyes. They saw each other then as naked and they were ashamed, not because their beautiful creation bodies were somehow shameful. Where did we ever get the idea the church taught that the body is wrong? That's not true. The body is totally affirmed. What is shameful is that now I have hidden something in my heart. I have betrayal in my heart. I'm hiding because I'm wrong. I'm guilty, and I don't want you to see me. I can't let you in to the intimate parts of myself. Their eyes were opened even as their eyes were closed to all that innocent relating, all that face-to-face -face connecting. What a wicked half-truth. Oh, yeah, your eyes will be opened just as everything is lost. And then fourthly, because you will be like God. That's tempting. Do any of you own a house? Does anybody own a car? I would like to sell you your car that you own. Could I sell you back your house that you own that you've worked hard to pay off? I would love to sell that to you. Would you like to do that? You can pay me. I'll give you a great rate. How about that? They already were like God. They were made in God's image. They were the rulers of the creation. They had dominion over all creatures. They were like God. And Satan said, why don't you buy this that you already have? Eat the fruit, your eyes will be open and you'll be like God. Instead, as their eyes closed and shame filled them, they became not like God. Oh, they knew now the difference between good and evil experientially, but from the fallen side. So that was his bait. Those were his half-truth deceptions. The text says it took a while for the woman to contemplate this. The fruit in the center of the tree that she had normally avoided, probably hadn't paid much attention to, suddenly became full focus, and she noticed some things about it. Ooh, that fruit is a delight to the eyes. Looks like it would be good food. It's probably from Whole Foods. It looks like it would make me wise. Look at that, it's nutritious, it's beautiful and aesthetically pleasing, and it makes me smart. What's not to like about that? These are the lures that we always have in whatever form you prefer them, to be smarter than other people, more attractive than other people, and to be healthy and happy about it at the same time. In his second, first epistle in 1 John 2, John says, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life these are the lures of the world, the triple whammy, that which is beautiful, that which is appealing, that which is vanity and prideful. We fall for it every time. No, oh, it's shiny. I want it. So she took and she ate, and the world cracked, and the serpent laughed, and God's heart broke. And worst of all to me, most chilling of all, text tells us, the woman took and ate, and then she gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. This is new information. Really? What? Adam was standing by her? The entire time that the serpent is weaving his spell, he's standing there and says nothing? When good men go quiet in the face of evil, the world breaks. What was he doing? Fooling with the remote? Trying to get another channel? 
His wife and our entire human race is being tempted to despair, and his vigilance was down. He was with her and said nothing. The passivity of men in the face of evil is our ruin. And he ate, and it was done. What a story. What a chilling story. Paul said in Romans 1, we studied this last fall, for although they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. How great an antidote would that have been if instead of taking the fruit in the moment, Eve had begun a recitation of things she was thankful for? What if she had said, thank you, God, that I live in this garden surrounded with all these fruit trees that are mine to be had? Thank you that I have this good man standing beside me whom I'm nudging to get to pay attention. Thank you that I can look forward to walking in the cool of the day with you. Thank you for creating me and giving me your word. Thank you for all these things. One minute of thankfulness would have caused the serpent's temptation to vanish like smoke. Or if she'd honored God enough to just wait a minute. You know, I'm going to get back to you, serpent, because I'm going to meet the Creator, the Lord God, at the cool of the day when He walks in the garden. I'll ask Him about what you said, and then I'll let you know what He says about what I should do. If she just put enough distance between her impulse and taking, everything would have changed. These texts are so foundational that you really can't deal with them without having a quote from George Herbert. So here's one from one of his prayers that he wrote, preached before a sermon. He preached better prayers before preaching than most preachers ever preach. Here's what he said. He said, Lord, you had placed us in this paradise and were pouring out on us your good counsels and your love until we interrupted your counsels. We disappointed your purposes, for we sold our God for an apple. We sold our glorious, our gracious God for an apple, and we still do it. We still swap him for money, for meat, for diet, for shiny stuff. Isn't that so damning? You'd put us in Eden, given us everything, and we sold you for an apple we didn't even need, for something that looked good, that seemed sophistication, seemed like it would be desirous. We lost you for nothing, and we still do it. Who's got stories like this? Who has such a high view of a human person that says, you were created in the express image of God. Your very life, the least of you, has such dignity that God confers the worth of his own image upon you. Who has such a dire view of the human heart to say we swapped out glory for something we already had, for something we didn't need, and we still do it? You know, if there were no solution, I don't think we could tell these stories. I understand why the world doesn't like these stories. They are way too devastating, way too exposing. I'd rather just live in self-delusion Just say, well, you know, I I can't help it. It doesn't really matter. I'm not accountable to anyone anyway. We're all muddling along the best we can. We just find some love when we can and it helps us along. That's such a much more deluded but palatable story than to think I had everything and I sold it for something I already had been given. I don't need it. It's dire. But thankfully, our story comes with a solution. Herbert's prayer continued. He said, but you, O Lord, who are all sweetness and patience and mercy, you made our salvation and not our punishment to be your glory. Isn't that lovely? God could have said, my glory will be seen among the angels when I give you what you deserve for being so stupid. But instead he said, no, I'm going to make your salvation my glory. So get this line, Herbert says, when we had sinned beyond any help in heaven or earth, then you said, lo, I come. Don't you love that? 
when we had sinned beyond any help in heaven or earth, when we were as lost as lost could be, God said, hold on. Let me roll up my sleeves a second. I'm on the way. When we are as desperate and despicable, as low down as you can get, God said, I'm on the way. Lo, I come. When we had totally made a mess of everything, God said, I'm going to come fix that. He stepped into our midst in flesh and blood in Jesus Christ. He rolled up his divine sleeves and said, I will make my way among you in the midst of you. It's so crucial that we understand the way the gospel stories are told. At the beginning of the gospels, we are told that Jesus, as he started his ministry, entered a period of temptation. He did the same thing that Adam and Eve did, only he had to make it right. This afternoon, read Matthew chapter 3 or Luke chapter 4 about his temptations, but just note some of the differences. Our first parents were placed in a lush garden of green and growing things, of ease and delight and ready access to the Father. Jesus began his ministry facing temptation in the wilderness, in the broken and barren place of the desert with no one to help him and no props to support him. Our first parents faced the temptation with their bellies full from eating all of the fruit that was available to them that satisfied them. They were overflowing with everything that they needed. Jesus began his ministry by fasting for 40 days and 40 nights and facing temptation while ravenous with hunger. And he declined. Our first parents wanted to take a shortcut to everlasting life and the knowledge of God by grasping fruit they didn't need when they were already full. Jesus, hungry and desperate with the power, declined Satan's temptation to turn stones into bread because he said, my people don't get to do that. I make my way like one of them, relying not on magic, but on the power of the Holy Spirit to sustain me. I will not make bread this way even though I'm famished. Our first parents shipwrecked human nature while still in the harbor, the safe waters of Eden. Jesus enacted faithfulness while on the stormy seas of temptation and brokenness and despair. We wanted to get on the throne of God. He stepped off the throne of God and said, I'll make my way by obedience even unto death. We grasped for life and lost it. He gave his life away to die that we might be saved. When we had sinned beyond any help in heaven or earth, Christ said, lo, I come. Do you see that? He's the new Adam. He's the restart of the human race. He is the new creation, undoing the fall of our first parents by making his way as one of us in faithfulness and obedience without any props or support so that those who are joined to him become new creation. We partake of his faithfulness. That's why you can't do the Christian life on your own. It's not about me trying harder to overcome the fall. It's about me being joined to the new Adam who places the new life of a new humanity inside me. That's how we make our way. We have these unbelievable stories of this incredibly high view of human nature and this incredibly low view of our despicable fall that's balanced and wrapped up and resolved in the greatest story of all time. When we had sinned beyond any help in heaven or earth, Christ said, lo, I come. Let him in more and more, the new Adam remaking your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for coming to us. Thank you for making your way in the midst of sin and brokenness and temptation. Thank you for recreating the world, for beginning the new Eden, the garden city where we will see God face to face yet again. Thank you for the promise of the new heavens and the new earth. Send us, we pray, into the adventure 
of bringing the new creation across the globe. In Jesus' name, amen.